All right. Well, it's one o'clock, so let's get started. Welcome to another segment of our mental health moments. Uh, hopefully, some of you are maybe listening to this as you take a walk outside because it is gorgeous. I kind of feel like summer might last forever. <laughs> if only we could be that lucky, right? So my name is Linda Gallick. I'm the health and well-being consultant here at Bell and Health, and we have a really uh, awesome segment planned for you today. So as always, I want to welcome uh, Charles Latour. He's our licensed behavioral health therapist. I'm hoping he's close by. Charles, how are you today? Good, good. How are you doing, Linda? Fantastic. Fantastic. I also want to welcome to our show today, Jody Anderson. Jody is our population health uh, team leader. She is also a uh, instructor for mental health first aid. So she's been trained in that arena and does a lot of work with that. And Jody is always a part of our planning of these segments. So Jody, so happy to, to have you here today. Happy to be here in person and see you all all of the activity and, and folks joining. Um, I'm always excited to see how the numbers are increasing and how people really utilize this um, every month to learn more. Absolutely. So we're really excited today to talk to you about something that's been out in the news just in the last couple of weeks, and maybe some of you have seen it, some of you haven't. But the U.S. Surgeon General actually put out a framework for the workplace for helping to construct some ideas and some policies and some practices within organizations for workplace mental well-being and health and well-being in general. So this is really exciting because what's being recognized is that there's all these reports of quiet quitting and the great resignation. And we know that COVID really has forever changed the way people are are interacting with their workplaces. And, and now more than ever, I think what this really does and why I was so excited to see it is that there is this great recognition of how the workplace is incredibly impactful in people's health and well-being. So we're excited to talk about that today. And we really invite you, get ready to do some chatting in. We really Really want to hear from you. We want to, this to be an interactive experience. We want to share some ideas today so that all of us are, are benefiting, maybe hearing about ideas that you have when we talk about these categories, or if there are things going on in your organization or other organizations that you've heard about, please share that with us. So I'm going to share a graphic, and this is going to be kind of the uh, framework today for what we're gonna focus on. So this was the graphic, and I'm hoping, Jody, thumbs up if you can see that, okay, you're my check, awesome. This is the graphic that was released by the Surgeon General, and you can see that we have, we have five big categories that go in this graphic, but in the center is the worker voice and equity. So I think that's a really awesome place to start. So the first number I want to throw out at everyone is just a random number, wondering if anyone knows what this is related to. The number is 81,396. 81,396. If anyone wants to chat in, does anyone want to guess what that number has to do with? And I'm watching the chat. Hours worked in a lifetime. Debbie Pats, you nailed it. You nailed it. So that is the average number that someone will spend at work in their lifetime. That is a number of hours. The only thing that the human being typically experiences more than that in their lifetime is sleep. Because typically we sleep seven days a week, but we maybe only work five. And of course, this is a number related to the United States. Over in Europe, they, they work a little less than we do. But isn't that astounding to think about? So again, we're really excited that the U.S. Surgeon General is giving some framework to help businesses and help organizations maybe do some work surrounding these topics. So let's start with Charles. Uh, Charles, do you want to kind of frame this up for us? And what were your thoughts when you saw the announcement with the U.S. Surgeon General? 
Yeah, I had a number of thoughts. And I also heard a podcast that he had done. I really enjoyed it. And you know, it's really interesting. It's the it's a to me, what I loved about it is three key things. One, it's still more and more our mental health matters more. Our mental health matters. It's part of our health. Part of what we've been doing for the last several years is being in a position where we see all of it together rather than health and mental health being separate. So that's one thing, a greater emphasis, greater focus. Secondly, the idea that we all have agency and some degree of control in how we do take our own health into our own hands. Um, it's, you know, we're the primary people responsible for our health and well being. And at the end of the day, no one can really do it for you, no matter how great your culture is, no matter how awesome your place of work is, the attitude you have and that you bring to it is key. But what I really liked about it as much as anything else is that work plays a role, right? Work plays a role. Even if you just go by those numbers, right? I oftentimes break it down by days, weeks, months of, um, and this idea that we've been throwing these words around for eons of time, years and years and years, work-life balance. And one of the things that I like most about this is a shift, we'll talk about it more when we get to it, but work-life harmony. Those numbers that you just captured earlier, that doesn't indicate balance, right? And the other thing that it doesn't indicate and really support is this notion of work and life. It, it supports it being separate when the reality is work is part of life. So it's, it's less important to separate them or balance them and more important to integrate them because work is part of our life and the better we work and, and get along with those at work and so forth, the better our life is going to be. So we are far gone from the days where they are different and separate entities that we're trying to balance and that we are more in keeping with finding a way to, to create some harmony with that. So those are the things that most initially jumped out to me and what I loved about uh, the work being done. Great, thanks for sharing that, Charles. Jody, what were your initial reactions when you first saw saw this information come out? Well, I was really excited, and I will admit I love a good framework. So, when and whenever there's a diagram or an infographic or, or something that helps to establish some structure around supporting mental and emotional well being, I'm all for it. And I'll just echo some of what Charles was saying. Is you know. Out of the pandemic, one of the good things that came forth was, I think, the recognition um, and the importance and the increased awareness that we can't just separate our mental health anymore. Um, we're doing new and good things to integrate behavioral health services into our other, which we used to know as basically our physical health services. So, um, you know, establishing that as increased awareness coming out of the pandemic in that. When we go to work, we don't just put our mental health in a locker or hang it up on a hook. It, it comes with us wherever we go and having that approach um, to address our mental health and support our mental health wherever we go, whether we're at home or at work or at play, you know, because our mental health impacts our ability to live, laugh, love and learn. And I think what's exciting about a framework is that this gives play, this gives, it's an opportunity to start somewhere. You know, here are some segments that businesses and organizations can actually look at and they can say, well, what do we have in this area? Or what could we add in this area? Yeah, because maybe we're a little weak here. So let's start out with the protection from harm. And I, I just want to kind of read what they have here because this is small print. Y'all maybe Ew. be able to see this. But um somebody, oh, we just yes. gotta mute somebody here. <laughs> um, so protection from harm, <clears throat> prioritizing workplace physical and psychological safety, enabling adequate rest, normalize and support mental health. 
operationalize DEIA norms, policies, and programs. So that's kind of some general specifications that they gave. And again, we would love to hear from you if you feel like your organization or an organization that you know about has something happening that would aid in this area. So Charles, what, what are your uh, thoughts as far as this protection from harm category? Well, I, to me, I think all of them, it's hard for me to say one is better than the other or most important, but in this one, if there is one to me that matters as much or is critical, again, they all are. I think of this as like the rice recipe for a break or a sprain, rest, ice, compression, elevation. Um, one helps the other one. You don't just do one. We don't know which one does the most. But we know doing all of them will help. Uh, I think of this as the same way. All of these are key. But to me, this one has maybe as much or more of the psychological component. And we'll talk about the psychology of each of them. But if we don't feel safe in anything we do, it doesn't matter. Our marital relationship, our friendships, our parent-child relationships, the relationships that we have, we need safety emotionally within them. How are we being treated? Do we know that our leaders care? Do we know that our, our leaders are interested? Can leaders show that they're interested in me, not just my performance? It's that whoever we're reporting to in our structure, and I'm very fortunate here personally, um, who I report to, she is wonderful. The people she reports to is wonderful. The whole structure, so that really matters. But ultimately, knowing that every day we're going to a place of safety rather than a place that lacks safety is critical to our overall well being. In fact, there are tremendous uh, research articles out there, studies that have been done. Just people who, where they live, when they wake up to start their day, if it's behind the eight ball in terms of safety, their longevity is threatened. So our physical and emotional safety is prominent and definitely pertinent to all of this. So I'm thrilled that it's there. So I want to call out the, you know, the, the side of psychology, though. And the key there, the psychological safety, is imagining someone going to work and they don't feel safe physically to begin with, whether it's machinery they're operating on, uh, routes that they have to take for their work, temperatures, whatever, all of those could be threats. But the one that I see more, most consistently that can impact people on a more emotional level and the things that they take home from work with them at the end of the day and the things that keep them up are the relationships where I don't feel emotionally safe in the relationships, whether it's my supervisor relationship, co-workers, the way I'm treated, workplace harassment, workplace bullying, those sorts of things. If those are things that are happening in the workplace and they're not dealt with in an effective, productive, beneficial manner, those things can really, really tear away at the, the physical and emotional well-being that people experience. But even taking it a step further, it doesn't have to be uh, something in the way of abuse or harassment or bullying. It's even a bar that we can set, which is for people to go in and emotionally feel that they can be their authentic selves. I can speak my mind effectively. I can, I can raise a topic that's great and feel really great about that. But I could also talk about something that I don't think is going that well, and maybe we can rethink it. Do I have the capacity, the trust in the people that I report to, to be able to do that? My honest self, not necessarily filtered or censored, but I can talk about great things but I could also bring up things that might need attention and maybe even some resolution. When we have that type of thing going on at work, people can feel that I can show up and I can be honest, I can be real, I could be myself, my most authentic best selves, 
And when we have that going on, we have a much more comfortable workplace. And we're also more productive in the work that we do when we have that physical and emotional safety. And as importantly or more, we're more helpful to other people. We're more engaged and we make others engage when we have that kind of physical and emotional safety. So one term I've used over time in these programs is a rising tide floats all boats. This is a perfect example of that. When we're all feeling that, we're all a little bit better. We all get better when this is happening. So more I want to say, but I want to pause there. I think Jody may have some comments as well on this. So I'll defer. Sure. Great stuff, Charles. And for this area, you know, protection from harm, I totally love that safety and security are highlighted. And I agree with everything that you said, Charles, and something that um, really comes to my mind when we're talking about workplace safety and psychological safety is um, putting on that psychological PPE. You know, we equip all of our healthcare workers with gloves and eyewear and all of that. How are we equipping them with their psychological PPE? And this is not just stuff that we only wear at work. It's stuff that we take home. Um, and it helps us to be more resilient so that when things are coming our way, we have that ability to recover. Um, one of the things that this area reminds me of is the, um, you know, prioritizing inclusiveness and, uh, you know, shying away and making sure that there are policies and procedures in place for harassment and discrimination and bullying. And if you all were to think about this area of the diagram, um, you know, do you know what to do? You know, do you know what your workplace resources are if some of these things could be happening to you, whether it's discrimination or bullying, or if you're feeling excluded? You know, do you have a person that you can talk to? So I think that's always a little nugget or a piece of homework that um, we can really practice and make sure that we are prepared to either support another person or know what resources we have if we need them. Great call out, Jody. And I think, you know, when I think about this area, I specifically tune into that psychological safety piece because I think that no one is going to be the best version of themselves in a workplace if they don't feel psychologically safe. And so for your organization, you may, you may be missing out on some really great innovation and some really wonderful ideas if people don't feel safe enough to share those ideas. So it's just really important to, to make that atmosphere. And even if you are listening to this segment today and you're not a, a so-called leader in your organization, we can all lead from where we are. And I think it all starts with just being willing to listen to each other. If you yourself can be the safe space for someone, even just one other employee, that, that can go a long way. So don't discount the value of, of what that really brings. Great discussion so far. We're going to need more time. Linda, before we jump on, I, I, that was so great what both of you said. There's one other thing that I feel is really important to highlight and double click and underscore on this concept is, is on the upside, there's listening, right? You know, being able to be heard. I always like this phrase, which is no one uh, likes to listen if they don't think they're gonna be listened to. So this two-way street of communication, it doesn't mean every idea that someone has will be done, it isn't that. But you had made a great, great call out with the, think of maybe an idea that someone had that they didn't think it would be listened to, we miss out on that, right? Or if there's an issue that supervisory or leadership isn't aware of, but it's going on, and the person feels uncomfortable calling it out, then we're missing out on how we can address potential issues as well. But there's one other thing I think in, you know, that I want to highlight in terms of why this is so important is, is the idea that people can speak what is important to them without retribution. It's one thing to be heard, but it's another one to think, okay, if I say this, is this going to affect me? Is this going to be a problem? If I say this, will I get in trouble for this just because I had this idea? Will mm -hmm. someone think less of me? Or if I'm calling out a problem, will I get in trouble for having voiced it? 
So that dynamic of fear of retribution is what keeps people less emotionally comfortable to speak what they feel may be very important. So um, again, so many things on this topic, but um, again, where we started from, I'm so happy that this is part of it. Well, let's move on to the connection and community. And I think Jody, this is a great one to start with you because you're also a connection to, to so much of the community work that Bellin does and connection with community ambassadors and all those wonderful things that are happening. So this bullet point, uh, creating cultures of inclusion and belonging, cultivating trusted relationships, fostering collaboration and teamwork. So what would you like to share about that, Jody? Well, when I think of the term community, um, oftentimes people's minds think of outside of work, but we have our own community uh, within our workplaces. So thinking about how your mental health impacts the person that you sit next to and how your emotional well-being um, can often rub off on other people. So thinking about your own workspace, I'm curious to know for the audience today if um, if they had to think of you know, some ways or some people at work that they feel have their back, if you wanna just chat in, do you have somebody at work that has your back or that someone that will support you or that you can reach out to if you need it and somebody that you trust? Just quick enter a yes or, or no. We have absolutely. Good. Hopefully we see lots yes. of yes. <laughs> and Ann Kressel has yes, which is good because she's on our team. <laughs> Great. Yep, we have more yeses for sure. Great. Fantastic. Good. And I'm so excited, you know, that we're seeing that. But I think it's important to recognize that not everybody feels that way or not everybody might have the luxury of having somebody that has their back. But what are some ways that we can foster that connection with our team members? And that's really where I'm interested to get some feedback from our audience today of like, what are some things that you do on a day to day basis that helps to foster that sense of community and connection with the people that you work with? I think it can be something even as simple as just taking the time to ask people how they're doing and really ask about the weekend or ask about the party they went to. It's just a way to get to know somebody a little bit better outside of all the work stuff and that can start to build some some of that trust. We have um, group chat to share humor. Uh, have a few minute conversation. Yeah, taking interest in other people's lives outside of the day to day work, I think is so important. And then making those mental notes about, you know, what did they say? Practicing those listening skills as you're connecting with other people so that you can build that, you know, build a stronger relationship with them. So who are their family members? You know, what kind of car do they drive? What do they like to do? What are some of their hobbies? That can also always strengthen those connections and that sense of community. Yeah, someone had commented earlier as well, you know, <laughs> listening, listening to understand, you know, mm -hmm. versus listening to respond. Charles, what are your thoughts on connection and community? I think those are all key. In fact, even starting with the listening piece is, um, you know, I think listening to with four ways, our ears to what's said, our eyes with what's being seen, the emotions, the, the heart with how the person's feeling, and the soul with what it means to them. You know, when we're listening yeah. on those four levels, we are in a totally different place, and that's what helps to get us to understanding rather than just content, which often we listen until we want to refute or dispute or rebut rather than take it all in. I like the phrase, which is listening so you get the full landscape of what's in someone's mind rather than a couple items that you hear enough so I can rebut. But, you know, in listening to the Surgeon General, one of the main things around this and one of the main things he's worked on over the years and, and has dedicated a lot of his career to it is the distinction between social and human connection versus social and human disconnection. Isolation um, and um, feeling alone when people have that. 
So the word inclusion, I think, is really, really key in all of this. When we feel part of something, something even greater than ourselves, that's what the beauty of being part of a team is, that we could all do something together that I maybe wouldn't have done on my own. So when we have that type of collaborative atmosphere, team-oriented atmosphere, it's all about the we rather than the me, we function at a much higher level. And again, that social connection rather than disconnection is key. One other thing I wanna say of why this is so important from a clinical standpoint, I wanna highlight two things. One is just from a pure health and well-being standpoint, most of the literature studies out there that we know at this time, social isolation is the new smoking. It is as detrimental to our health and well-being as smoking has been over the years. That's how important it is. Secondly, from a mental health standpoint, the number of people that I've seen over the years dealing with workplace stress, workplace mm -hmm. difficulty, workplace relationship issues, where they're feeling either left out or not part of, not included, not part of the team, and, or, and even sometimes intentionally feeling excluded, not heard. That social disconnection when it's taking place at work has such a profound effect on people's well being. And you know, the tears shed over the years of hearing that different people over time, it's incredible the effect that that has on individual and then families that they go home and you know, the family members can't help but see what this person's going through. So there's a ripple effect in what we take home, so on and so forth. So again, as I said before, they're all important, but you know, this is absolutely critical, understanding this and how we have to understand how to be the best at this for people's well-being. I was really thinking about with this one, how earlier in my career, I had a supervisor that reprimanded me for visiting with people. You know, he didn't want me to get the reputation that I wasn't focused on work. And now I work in a place where it's okay to stop and visit with people. In fact, it's encouraged. <laughs> Because again, we're building those trusted relationships and that's that's part of how we do it. Not that we should be just visiting eight hours a day. There's work to be done, of course, but there's definitely a balance there. Yeah, and I think about that's such a great point, Linda. And looking back to at the time where the pandemic started, this took one, this is one of the things that took the greatest hit of the people who a lot of their livelihood from a connection standpoint is the people that they work with. Uh, people who lost that were some of those who struggled the most and um, how long it went on before we had that connection being able, because you know, on the screen is great, but the in-person, some of the informal, whether it's telling a joke, talking about a movie or a book we read or whatever, those, those things don't seem to happen and translate on the screen, but when you're talking with people, it, it does. And I love that you feel that that's what you have and how important that is to how we appreciate and, and love what we do. So it's absolutely great. Yeah. Well, let's move on to work-life harmony. So I would love to hear from those of you that, that are tuning in today, I would love to hear your recommendations for how you work in that work-life harmony. And uh, if your organization is doing something too, we would love to hear those, those ideas. And uh, Judy, I just wanna ask you because you know, this one talks about providing autonomy over how work is done, making schedules, flexible and predictable, uh, respecting boundaries between work and non-work time. And I know, Jody, you're a leader and you supervise some people. So how do you, how do you focus on work-life harmony for yourself and then for your team? It's, it's a balancing act, right? In figuring out what works best for you and recognizing, you know, I think, you know, back to the pandemic, um, how that just created a total shift. Everybody went home and, um, you know, years ago, I 
you know, worked for an organization. And if you weren't there physically, you weren't working, you know, um, and that ne wasn't necessarily the truth. You know, we can do work outside of the home. In fact, so many people are finding that they're even more productive not being in an office. And I think I can just, you know, share about some of our experience here over in business and community health. It, there's a lot of autonomy and flexibility, and I certainly see that people are happier, you know, and they recognize what's a good, you know, when's a good day that I just need to be at home so I can focus and get my list of things done. And also, you know, maybe Linda, you can even share too. When are those days that oh, I just need to be with people? I just need that interaction because that is going to fill my cup and then I'm going to be able to be more productive from there. Yeah, and I'm I'm happy to share that uh, we do have such great autonomy in our department. And I am um, a gal who lives north of Green Bay, and I greatly enjoy the luxury of being able to work a lot from home. And I'm one of these uh, people that my brain is just best in the morning. So my husband thinks I'm a little bit crazy, but I might I might turn my computer on at six thirty in the morning and and start working. And uh, and that is not from a place of being a workaholic, believe you me, but that's when my brain is best. So that's when I really like to work and that works really well for me. Then there's days where it's like, wow, I'm feeling a little disconnected from my team. I haven't seen folks in a while. I think there's there's some stuff going on and, and even some of those social situations, you know, if there's, mm -hmm. if there's a food day or a baby shower or something like that, it's important to, to be present for those and be connected to the team. And I crave that. So I make sure that, that I come in because I am a social person too, that, that wants to be with my teams, but the, the ability for me to make those choices is just gold to me. I can't <laughs> thank our department enough for giving me that privilege. It is, it is glorious. It will keep me here for sure. I love it. So Charles, what do you think about the work-life harmony balance? What do you, what do you think is important for people? And, and then what can organizations do? Because obviously if, if you own a restaurant or something like that, you need people there. Your, your people need to, need to come in. Uh, what, what do you think that they can do to help people in this area? I think it's, there's a couple different things that, that I really got out of this. And, and what I've seen people working on is in a day and an age where pay means so much, the benefit package that we have means as much as it ever has before. Like what, what were we able to do? I know I have a nephew who right now, as we speak is on paternity leave when i was raising my when my son was born this is obviously a number of years ago now that wasn't even i don't even know that that was a concept let alone something that an organization would do and now it doesn't matter if it's a mom or a dad that a dad can do that so i think the key things in it really are the flexibility and the autonomy that any degree of flexibility and autonomy that you create, we are people who need that. To, we have the capacity to pick what's best for us. It doesn't mean everything's carte blanche, but the flexibility that I have, I'll give you an example. Several weeks ago, I had a little bit of a nag, nagging, hacking cough. Still do a little bit every now and then. Um, but I was able to do all my sessions from home by video. It affected nobody and it, I had the flexibility to do that. So that wouldn't have happened three years ago, but, but now it could. But I think there's uh, going back to the other comment that I've said is earlier, it isn't about balancing act, which people always tend to make it be, but it's all about integration and how much work you know, what it means to me and what I mean to work and how well we integrate. Yeah, I love that. And, and just love the awareness of whatever that can look like for your organization. And if you are not sure what flexibility can look like for your organization, I have a little tip for you. Ask your people. Ask your people their ideas. 
get their input. What would they love to see? It might even be something as simple as, I wanna make sure I have off the second Thursday of, of every month and that they can always plan whatever they need to on that day. So definitely ask, ask your, your employees. Let me throw one other thing out there, Linda. That's such a great comment. That one of the things that I've seen over time for many people has been this concept of when I'm there, I want to be there fully. When I'm not, I want to be gone fully. Um, so, and, and basically what I'm saying there is people who have had vacations but work the whole time. I was on my computer the minute I got up to the minute I got to bed. The good news, I was in Hawaii. The bad news, I didn't really enjoy it because I was on my computer the whole time, right? What's expected when we're there, we're there. When we're not, we're not. The other thing that I've heard people comment on over time has been, uh, I sent an email at one in the morning and then someone responded like, why are you sending emails at one in the morning as well? Why are you answering it? You know that. <laughs> That, that sort of thing. And um, I know Jody believes in this too, is that we have to, at leadership has to model that. If we're sending, then there's this unspoken expectation that I should be available at one. Um, I'm, I love to sleep. I'm not available for all that many emails at one in the morning. And I'm half assuming that other people are taking that opportunity too. So I think part of that um, harmony is when I'm there, I'm there, but when I'm on vacation, I really wanna take vacation or whatever that may look like for you. So I think that's key when employers can foster that type of attitude, both in what they provide as well as what is actually happening to them. In this digital age, when we are assumed to be always available, are there times that we can limit that availability and not feel there will be retribution for that? That's what the harmony part for me is all about. I am loving what Tammy just chatted in. Yes. Tammy, we offer unlimited paid time off to our team and we have for three years. No real abuse of this. It has to be approved one month ahead. And it is amazing for our team to know that they will be able to be off when they need to for milestones in their lives. Love oh, it. I have goosebumps. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. That's great. That's great, Tammy. So cool. So cool. Well, let's move on. We have two more categories. Um, we have mattering at work and we have opportunity for growth. And again, please keep chatting in, keep chatting in. We love hearing from you. So mattering at work, providing living wage, engaging workers in workplace decisions, building a culture of gratitude and recognition, connecting individual work with organizational mission, and then the opportunity for growth, uh, that quality training, education and mentoring, fostering clear equitable pathways for her advancement and ensuring relevant reciprocal feedback. And Jody, I know you and I were talking a little bit earlier yeah. about that recognition piece. Do you want, do you want to share some of that with, sure. with, with everyone? I, I think it's so important, you know, for people to feel respected and valued at work. That's just huge. And yesterday, um, Ashley Lyman, I don't know if she's on the call today, but she shared at one of our um, system strategy days, uh, about a program that they're working on. And she shared some information that I would just like to share some statistics with the group. Um, so it talked about the importance of positive recognition on happiness on work at work. So how happy we feel at work and how we can get that out of recognition. And by recognizing an employee daily, they are 94% happier. If we did this weekly, it's 85% happier. A few times a month could be 80% and even just monthly can improve a person's happiness at work by 75%. Um, she shared the infographic uh, with me and I think you know we'd be happy to share that out with the group when we send out the recording. Um, but I was just amazed at that and thinking about ways you know within our organization we have a lot of different ways that we provide um, recognition um, giving somebody a bell and star going on lulu and we have kind of the internal infrastructure to do that we have our vips which are just an amazing opportunity to recognize but 
I'd like the, the group just to think back for themselves, you know, what are the little day to day things that we can do to recognize um, our coworkers and recognize, you know, how they make us feel and, and how they help us to feel welcomed at work and are a part of our community. And I think it can, again, be a really simple thing. I think I, I even just feel recognized when somebody says, hey, I saw this that you did, or I heard that you were involved in this. And it can literally be a 20 second conversation, but it just mm -hmm. means a lot because it means that somebody was paying attention to something that I was involved with. And I, I think that always really means a lot. Yeah. Charles, what, the, what, oh, oh, I was just gonna say, one of the things that I do wanna point out as I'm, staring at this framework, I just want people to notice that, you know, there's no beginning or end to this framework. It's all interwoven and connected and the important pieces and even how it's labeled is the five essentials. So essential is stuff that you just can't do without. So how can we start working on these essential things so that we can reap those benefits of being happier and having a better, um, better mental health? Absolutely. Charles, what are you thinking as far as mattering at work and, and those a couple different things? I think we we have a great format here at Bellin of how we're all part of a mission and, and how we help everybody who walks through the door, no matter who we are. So the Surgeon General talking about this actually told a story, reminded me of one that I've used for the longest time. But it's think of a school, think of a hospital, someone who does the floors. Hospitals are about cleanliness, sa uh, sanitary. The cleaner they are, the better they are. Schools too. Um, anybody from whatever the spectrum is important to the success of where we are, everything matters. So the story that I'm thinking of that I wanna share just briefly, it's just a quick one, I'll condense it. I know we're running a little bit short on time, but there's this story of, um, these masons, bricklayers were busy at work um, and this person said to them, I think the story is even this little kid came and said, what do, you, what do you do? And one said, whatever they tell me to do. And the other one said, what are you doing? I'm just putting one brick on top of another. And then to the other person, what are you doing? And the person said, I'm helping build a place of dreams where someday somebody may come in and get married or somebody will do this. So I'm building a place for faith and dreams in people's lives. So when we have, when what we do matters and it should be, we all feel that way in what we do when it matters to us. So it's, it's, it's a reciprocal both ways. Do, does the organization help us feel that we matter or only certain people do? Is it everybody, certain people, some and not others? Or are we all included in how much we all matter? And then the other one is our reflection of work. What we do and how much we matter is how much we're gonna put into it. The other example of that is there was someone who was doing the floors at NASA. And when asked what his role was, he said that, I think someone said, do you do the floors here? He said, no, I helped put someone on the moon. So we're all part of that when it matters to us. So again, it works both ways. Love that story, Charles. That's awesome. Jody, what are your thoughts? No, I just, I always just love Charles' story because it, <laughs> anytime he tells the story, because it helps me then to remember um, all these foundational pieces. It's a great connector. I was at a wellness conference recently too, and they uh, showed a photo of a woman that did, um, she was one of the janitors at a university and they had interviewed her and this had to do with finding purpose in your work. And they had interviewed her and they asked her what the, her least favorite part of the job was. And she talked about cleaning the women's bathroom on a Monday morning in a dorm after everyone had partied for the weekend. And she said, that's important because I don't want these kids to get sick. And so that was her purpose. That's what she found in, in her purpose of, of cleaning those bathrooms. So I thought that that was just a really 
cool story. It just shows that all of us, if we take the time and energy to really think about it, we can connect to something that does matter in our organization for sure. Well, we are running out of time here, but I do want to get just some parting thoughts from everyone. Um, there were a couple things in the chat I just wanted to be mentioned. And let's see here. So Marine has its World Kindness Day on Sunday, November 13th. So definitely spread some kindness around. Uh, Tammy also had some ideas in here, a $5 Starbucks gift card, group message the team, $5 card for ice cream, an old fashioned written note. Yes, those it, are always Tammy. so great. nice to receive those handwritten notes. So just this really powerful framework. We will send this graphic out so everybody has it handy along with a link to the full article. The full documentation is about 48 pages long. If anyone wants to take the time to dig into that, there is some really interesting info in there. So we will send that out along with the graphic that Jody was talking about with recognition. But Charles and Jody, I just want to get your final thoughts today as, as people in their organizations look to maybe get started in this framework. You know, what would what would you all recommend as, as where they should start? So, Charles, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, opportunity for growth, great article, Harvard Business Review. Nothing came close to what matters to most at people at work than trying to get better. So, anyway, we are getting better, helping others get better. We are all getting better because of that. Final notes as far as just generally, I think part of what we've heard today is kindness. I love this one quote, which is in a world in which we could be anything, let's at least be kind. So if we could do that, and sometimes kindness because of all that's happening in our world forces us, if we're gonna be that way, we have to be mindful. So I love the idea of being mindful enough to live your life in such a way that you're not missing it and that you're bringing love in your heart and all the things that you approach and the people you approach. And if we could all do that a little bit better, we'll all be a little bit better. And happy holidays coming up to everybody and a great Thanksgiving and gratitude. Yes, and speaking of gratitude, that's another great way to you know, support your own mental health, thinking about you know, what, are, what are you most grateful for and do that every day, write down three things at the end of the day or even at the beginning of the day. Um, and then recognizing your your work family as truly part of your family and how um, you can support one another and utilize this framework that is full of those essential needs that we have around mental health and recognizing that we can't put our mental health on a shelf. It comes with us wherever we go. Well, thank you to the two of you. So much great information today. We could talk for hours. I just feel like there's so much we could get into, but thank you for the two of you to, for giving us your time today and all your great insights. I think that this really shows we have an immense opportunity to really make an impact in our workplaces to help people be better uh, in terms of their mental health and well-being. So, so don't think that you can't make a change, that you as a single person can't impact someone, because indeed you can. And if you need ideas, this is a great framework to start okay. with. Um, and we're here at Bellin to, to help you as well. So please feel free to reach out to us. So thanks again for all of you joining us today. What a great conversation. Enjoy the rest of this beautiful day. And uh, happy holidays, as Charles said, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Take care, everyone. Thank you.